everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for our last segment of what to do if you find a wild animal that you feel is in need. Uh, we've already talked about uh, baby birds and baby mammals, uh, but today we're going to discuss what to do if you find an injured adult or an adult animal that you are concerned about. So most of our patients that come in uh, are babies, they are young, they need our help, uh, but we do take in our fair number of adults that have been injured one way or another uh, or uh, that people are concerned about that we do health checks on. So uh, again, as always, we'd like to remind you that the advice and information that we give is based off of Virginia's Department of Game and Inland Fisheries laws, rules, and regulations. Uh, and if you are in another state, to please consult your state's regulations and rehabbers uh, first to make sure that their information, uh, which might differ from ours, uh, is the best information that you're getting, the best advice uh, that we have to offer. So again, as always, if you think you have a wild animal in need, please call a local rehabber. Uh, they're gonna be your best resource to cover what animals, uh, what animals need, what behaviors they have, what you're seeing so they can kind of help you talk through uh, what you think is going on, what might be going on, and, and how we can help. So always make sure you reach out to those resources uh, before attempting any rescue to make sure that you and the animal stay as safe as possible. So the first major group that we'll talk about uh, are mammals. So we get in a lot of mammals every year uh, from mice all the way up to uh, larger things, raccoons, opossums, sometimes even uh, as large as bobcats and beavers uh, that do come, up, uh, come into us. So uh, always, if you see something, give us a call. We're more than happy to kind of talk you through uh, certain behaviors. Uh, one of the big calls that we take every year, uh, especially this time in the spring and summer, we get calls about uh, primarily nocturnal animals that are seen during the day and people are concerned about rabies. Uh, that is not the only indication. So in the spring and summer especially, they have babies to feed. Those mammals, if it takes all night to feed yourself, it's going to take some daylight hours to feed anywhere between two to seven extra mouths. So you may see uh, those mammals up during the day as well. So if you are concerned about rabies, uh, we ask that you look for other behaviors. How's their mobility? Can they use all of their limbs properly? Um, are, they, uh, are they properly afraid of humans? Like they should be, we're a large predator. Uh, they shouldn't want to come up to us. They shouldn't want to pay any attention to us. And if they see you coming, they should run. So these are kind of things that we look for. So other behaviors are something that uh, we would ask you questions about. And it's always good to have that information. On that vein, uh, the first question we're going to ask you is, is it injured? Uh, and that's, that's something I know we know that sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, you can't see some obvious injuries. Um, a head trauma is not going to present itself uh, the same way a broken leg would. Uh, but that's a question that we're going to ask first. Is it injured? If it's not injured, we're going to ask other behaviors, uh, other behavioral questions to see if we can figure out how long it's been there, uh, what it might be doing there, and whether or not it does need our help. Um, injured animals, we would recommend getting them into care and we can have rehabilitators talk you through uh, how to do that. So an animal that is uh, injured, again, if we advise containment or if you're able to get it contained, uh, never handle any anything with your bare hands. Start with gloves and then use blankets, towels, and tools to either get them in or under something that a, a more experienced rehabber uh, can come and get them uh, fully contained. That's for your safety and the animal's safety. Uh, rabies is a, a big zoonotic, so zoonotic is a disease that can be passed from animals uh, to non-animal uh, to humans and, and then back. Uh, so we want to make sure that again we're keeping you and those animals safe. So making sure you have proper protection layers between you and that animal uh, is always important. So from there, uh, if, um, if you think that the animal is injured and needs help, getting it contained, getting it uh, closed off is important. A lot of animals, even if they uh, don't seem to be moving very fast, they do know once they kind of figure out that you're watching, they know that they're injured and they're going to want to hide themselves. An injured animal that disappears into brush or out of sight under your porch, we're not going to be able to help that animal. So containment uh, or blocking somehow and keeping your eye on that animal uh, throughout our, our conversation or our trip to you uh, is always the, the best first thing. Um, so. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that's important to know about uh, rabies is there's actually two forms. So a lot of people, when we call and we say uh, this animal might be rabid, uh, we get the answer, he's not foaming at the mouth, 
I don't think it's rabies. He's not very angry. There are two forms. You have the dumb form and the rage form. The rage form is the foaming at the mouth, the overaggression. And while that is the more commonly known form, it's actually the lower likelihood form that they have. So they're less likely to have that rage form, to have those characteristics, and they're more likely to have what we call the dumb form of rabies. And there's no way a baby could have rabies, right? So there is a way for babies to have rabies. So rabies is one of those diseases that can actually be passed from mother to baby in utero. So babies can unfortunately be born with rabies. It's also passed through saliva and blood, urine, things like that, bodily fluids. So a mother licks her young, her saliva gets in their mouths, in their nose, in their eyes, and they can actually pass the rabies that way as well. So a small animal, even the tiniest baby raccoon, a couple days old, is a potential risk for rabies. So again, make sure that you have proper protection between you and that animal. We do not like to test babies, but we are required to do so if the health department, Virginia's, your county's health department decides there has been a credible risk of exposure between you and that animal or your domestic pets and that wild animal, they do require us to euthanize that animal for testing. So those decisions are never ours. They are made by the health department and by law, we have to follow them. If we do not follow those, we lose our permits, we can't help anybody. So we do not want to have to do that. So again, please make sure that you are protecting yourselves and by protecting yourselves, protecting those animals. So the dumb form of rabies is usually characterized by, for the most part, a non-fear of things they should be afraid of. Animals sitting in the middle of the road, people think they might have gotten hit by cars, but quite honestly, they don't know they're not supposed to sit in the road. So if we don't see any obvious wounds, no blood around the face, we lean more towards rabies in those situations and we want to make sure that you're careful. So if you see those things, raccoons walking right up to people, sitting in the middle of a construction site, not seemingly disturbed by loud noises and lots of people, or again, sitting in the middle of the road where it would be dangerous for them to be, these are things that we're concerned about and we want to make sure that you stay safe. The other big disease that we get a lot of calls about for mammals is mange. So foxes in our area and out in Northern Virginia, they get a spider-like mite on their body, which causes the mange. And what it does is it actually causes two levels of a disease. The mites themselves, they cause itching, scratching, they're biting down into the skin and that causes the foxes to do extra scratching and that opens up sores. Those sores on the body let in secondary infections. There are medications that you can buy to treat them. These medications are rated for horses, cows, livestock, and we do not want you to use those. For one, it's illegal. It is not legal for you to medicate wildlife. It's not, and it's not always effective. Generally it isn't for one of two reasons. It's a very weight specific medication. So if we don't know the animal's weight, we can't give them a proper dose. You can't guess at things like that. If you give them too little, it's ineffective. If you give them too much, it can actually kill them. It can kill them. It can kill other animals that accidentally eat it. There's no guarantee the piece of chicken or food that you put out that has this medication in it is getting to the right box. Another fox could come along and steal it sooner. Something smaller could come along and these things can have devastating effects. Um, the other reason that it's not effective is that secondary infection. Uh, the medication that's sold is only to treat the, the mite, the spider-like mite, and not that secondary infection. So even if you successfully somehow feed that fox the medication, it's the right thing, and they, uh, the mite dies, they don't, aren't getting antibiotics for those sores and they can uh, die from sepsis from that. So if I see a mangy fox in my backyard, does that mean my dog is going to get mange now? So mange usually takes over for animals that are um, either living in the same den. They, uh, mange ends up in uh, denning areas, so they kind of end up reinfecting themselves, even if they're keeping themselves clean. Uh, then they go back to those same den sites and get 
reinfected. Uh, as long as these foxes or animals are not sharing bedding with your animal and your animal is relatively healthy and you keep them clean, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, if you do see mangy animals in your neighborhood and you're concerned, talk to your vet and they'll be able to let you know if there's preventative measures you can do to protect your animals and yourself. So if you find an animal with mange that you're concerned about, uh, we want to make sure that we do the right thing by them and you can always give us a call and let us know. Um, here in Virginia, rabies vector species, uh, such as foxes, they have to be released in the county that they are rehabbed in. So if we take uh, foxes from all over Virginia uh, that have you know, minor cases of mange that may be able to heal themselves, if we take all of those foxes in, they all have to be released here in Clark County. Uh, and while it is a, a beautiful country county, uh, we do have a lot of foxes here of our own and adding more foxes to those actually can compound the problem. So we're going to run low on food, water, uh, and other resources. This increases fights between animals, uh, and it can actually increase mange. So mange is a, um, a big issue that people think is happening because these foxes with all the development are crowding closer and closer together. So they're not able to move to new places. They, don't have, they aren't able to get away from the uh, infected areas and keep themselves healthy. They're just kind of forced to, to reinfect themselves over and over again. Uh, the other thing that's important for mammals is please do not relocate what are considered nuisance animals. So if you find an animal that's not injured and you just don't want it to be there, um, there are repel and exclusion techniques that we can talk you through to helpfully get that animal uh, to move on its own to a place of its choosing. So it's chosen your space for a, for a reason. There's food, water, shelter, uh, they have a family there, whatever it is, and trapping and relocating, even driving it 10 miles away to an area you think is very nice, um, can be devastating for that animal. Not only are they losing their home and their territory, uh, but the space you pick may not actually support another animal of that species or that animal at all. Um, so they choose these spaces for a reason and moving them to places that we think are good uh, may not actually be in that animal's best interest. So using repel and exclusion techniques, we can get them to realize that your backyard, your shed, your barn, uh, wherever they're living, that you don't want them, is a, an inappropriate place for them to live and they can decide to move on and then pick their own spot from there. So those things are very important uh, when it comes to finding animals in your backyard. Um, please be kind to your wild neighbors. Um, we wanna make sure again that you and them are as safe as possible. So we're gonna move on to, to birds. Um, birds are probably one of the largest groups of animals that we uh, take in here at the center. We take in a very wide variety uh, of birds, songbirds, raptors, waterfowl uh, that come in here to us. So again, our first thing is always make sure if you find a, an animal in need, call your local rehabber. Uh, they'll be able to talk you through what you're seeing and what you might need to know. Um, this is important again for the wide variety of birds. Different birds have different uh, behaviors that we want to take a look at uh, and decide whether or not it's an issue. For example, the killdeer, a small ground nesting bird, uh, their mother will actually uh, fake a broken wing to lure you away from the nest. So we would want to talk you through and decide is that animal truly injured or is she uh, using this tactic to protect her babies? Do we want to take this animal away from her family if she has one or do we want to observe a little longer and see if she was just uh, faking it? So these are things that we always want to make sure before we just swoop in and rescue an animal that may not need our help. The other thing that it's important to know, while it is legal for birds to come across the state line into Virginia, we do always want to make sure that we are getting the bird uh, to the most, to the closest, most capable person first. Um, so please do not just pick up a bird and immediately drive it to us. Make sure you talk to your local rehabbers. There may be somebody in your area uh, that will be able to get that bird help sooner and be able to return that bird back to its territory uh, after it's recovered. So we wanna make sure they stay as close to their territory as possible. Uh, that's gonna be the best way to help them long-term. So as with the mammals, we always wanna know, is it injured or not? Uh, obvious injuries are going to be um, uh, easy to see. Uh, blood, hanging, hanging a wing, uh, broken wings, things like that, you might be able to see. Not using a leg, you're going to be able to see. Uh, so we always wanna ask that first. If you don't see those injuries, then uh, we'll move on to, to other questions, again, about their behavior to determine, is this something that we need to come and rescue? 
Uh, songbirds, for example, we get a lot of uh, window strike songbirds. So they, uh, they see windows as, a lot of times they see windows as pass-throughs, especially windows that are facing each other. Um, so they just see a corridor, they look in one window and they can see out the other, and they think they can fly straight through, and so they'll go at these windows full speed. Um, they also do this if they're being chased, if they're uh, concerned, they're not even going to see it, they're just going to think it's an escape, a dark cave that they can go to, they're going to go for it. Um, these animals, if they don't have any obvious injuries, um, we can recommend maybe giving them a safe dark space for a couple of hours to uh, recuperate, to get over their headache, and then see if they can fly from there. So that's something that we can advise you to do, talk you through, uh, and see if that helps the bird. If they're not able to fly, then again, we'd be more than helpful, uh, more than happy to take them in uh, and get them the care that they need. Another thing that we see with songbirds is something called mycoplasma. Um, this affects finches the most, uh, and, and this is a it's conjunctivitis or, or swelling uh, of your eyes. It's, it's kind of a version of pink eye. Uh, and this actually happens from uh, dirty feeders. Uh, so it's always important for, uh, for songbirds, if you have feeders in your backyard, uh, to follow a couple of protocols to help keep them safe. Um, one, make sure you're doing a, a daily cleanup. Clean up around the ground uh, and on the tray. Any uneaten seeds should be thrown away at the end of the day. Um, this prevents it from growing mold if it gets wet, um, from collecting fecal matter that birds may have left behind, uh, and, and contaminating the rest of the seeds. We want to make sure uh, any seed that's not eaten at the end of the day gets disposed of. Um, this also keeps uh, predators like raccoons, foxes, opossums from coming close to your house as well because they will come and eat those seed, uh, especially in the fall. Bears as well will come in and take uh, bird feeders that are full of seed. They'll, they'll take them right off the tree. So we want to kind of keep those things from happening. The other thing that we recommend uh, are tray feeders rather than the tube feeders. So the tube feeders, um, they can, a uh, bird has to stick their head in a hole. If they are ill, they can leave germs on the, on the, on the hole itself. The next bird who comes in also puts their head in that hole uh, and can pick up those germs around their eyes. So tray feeders are better uh, than tube feeders, but if you have either, um, we recommend a weekly disinfecting uh, process. So once a week, Take your feeders down, empty them, clean them, and then soak them in a 10% bleach solution for 15 minutes, fully submerged. You have to turn them over, turn them over. Um, rinse them fully and then let them dry for a full 24 hours before you rehang them. So to make sure they're fully dry and fully clean before we use them again. Uh, and this is one way to help reduce uh, these kinds of uh, sicknesses that we see uh, here at the center. So, um, uh, another reason that we take in uh, songbirds are glue traps. Uh, we know glue traps are uh, a method that is used for pest uh, control, uh, leaving those glue traps on the ground catch, uh, to catch mice or insects that are living in the house. Uh, unfortunately for birds and for uh, snakes, for, reps, for some reptiles, these glue traps just look like a free buffet of food. Uh, once they come down, they get stuck. Um, this can pull on wings feet, feathers, and can do a lot of damage. If you find a small bird attached to a glue trap, the best thing is to take it, trap and all, and bring it to a rehabber. We have a proper uh, removal techniques and we can make sure it's done in the safest way uh, for the bird uh, and, and again for you. Um, please do not cut feathers to get these birds off these traps. Uh, it takes a while for those feathers to either be molted or we have to pull them out so they can regrow, which is painful. Cut feathers will prevent them from flying. So again, the best recourse is to just take the whole trap, bring it to us, and we can deal with it from there. Uh, the next group of birds that we, we get calls about are waterfowl. Um, these are ducks and geese. Uh, we get a lot of calls about them, especially uh, around ponds, in parks. We see a lot of these, uh, of these geese. Um, if you see a bird like a goose or even anything uh, with a broken wing uh, or a, a broken bone that you suspect, uh, it's always best to get it sooner rather than later. Uh, bird bones can actually start repairing in a week. So we want to make sure that the sooner we get it, uh, the more likely we're able to help it. Bones that have already started to peel, to remodel, uh, are very difficult to fix. So if they have overlapping spaces uh, or if they have dead bone that they're losing, they're going to lose length in their wing and that's going to prevent them from flying down the road. Uh, this is especially important for waterfowl because we understand that if they get in the water, they're, they're pretty much 
uh, in trouble uh, in that case. We don't have boats. We're not able to swim out and catch them. If they can get on the water, it's almost impossible to get them from there. So again, if, it, if you see it and give us a call and we advise you to do so, try to get that bird contained, locked up in a garage, in a fenced in yard, with a laundry basket over top of it, anything that will keep them from disappearing. Again, a, a, an animal that is injured, that disappears from sight, is an animal we cannot help. It may take a while for them to come back into that area again, uh, and by then it may be too late for us to help it. So make sure that as soon as possible um, we get it contained, uh, and, and then we were able to uh, discuss the situation uh, and hopefully get it help from there. Another big uh, call we get from uh, about waterfowl is a condition called angel wing. Uh, now this is not something that we would ever expect you to diagnose by yourselves, um, but it is a, a situation that we would like you to be aware of. Uh, sometimes we get calls about waterfowl that we uh, are told have a broken wing. They can see the underside of the feathers uh, showing, uh, showing up along uh, the wing. Uh, this is a condition known as angel wing. Uh, and this is where, as, they, uh, as this bird was growing, so it started as a baby, as this bird was growing, uh, they got too, uh, too rich of a diet, the wrong nutrients growing up, and it caused their feathers to start to grow in before their bones were strong enough to hold it. And it ends up twisting the wrist so that the underside of those primary feathers are showing when the wing is folded against the body. This is a condition we cannot fix once it happens. Um, so adult birds that have this condition, uh, we may just give you the advice to leave be uh, if they are living on a pond, if they seem healthy. Um, but again, it is something that you should be aware of that is out there that we might discuss with you. So the last group, again, uh, for, for, uh, for birds, the last group are raptors. Uh, so these are hawks, owls, eagles, vultures, those large birds of prey uh, that have the beak and the talons that are, that are more dangerous uh, from the, the other birds that we've discussed. Uh, a lot of times we get calls about raptors on the ground. Um, a big thing to realize is that larger raptors like hawks and owls um, will stay on the ground with their food. Um, this happens a lot in the median on highways. They catch small mice and things that you aren't able to see in the grass, but they're unwilling to leave uh, their prey behind. They're going to eat it right there. Uh, or they might have a full crop, uh, so they've eaten a, a big meal and it's actually made them too heavy to fly. Um, so we're always going to ask you, how long has that animal been there? Did you see it just today? Did you see it as you were driving and now you're, you're gone 20 miles away and you don't know if it's still there? Um, these are things we're going to want to know. And if possible, we always ask that you stay with the bird. Um, can you sit there while somebody comes to help? Um, can you keep an eye on it until somebody can get there? Again, to make sure that these animals don't disappear, or in the case of animals on, on highways, that they don't wander into traffic. Um, please make sure it's safe for you to do so. Please don't park in medians or the uh, authorized vehicle only sections and say that we told you to do it. We want to make sure that you're doing things that are safe for you and safe for the animal. Um, make sure that you call the rehabber and they've given you the best advice that they could possibly give you for that. Um, again, the beak and the talons are very sharp, um, so if you are trying to contain an animal on a rehabber's advice, gloves, towels, blankets, laundry crates, anything you can to keep that animal from disappearing, and feel free to, to get it contained and have uh, somebody come out uh, and try to, to help you get it uh, completely contained and then brought into care. Uh, Again, location is always important. Uh, we want to make sure that adult animals go back to where they were found. So this includes all birds, mammals, and especially reptiles that we're going to talk about in a minute. Knowing exactly where a bird was found or within a mile of where uh, an animal was found is going to increase their chances when it comes to releasing them or getting back, them back to a territory that they know, that has uh, all the resources that they need. Uh, to not only survive, but to thrive. We want to make sure we get them back there. Uh, this is the most important information we can give you for our last group, which is reptiles and amphibians. Um, so these are our turtles, frogs, snakes, um, that kind of group. These animals can stay in a territory of, of one mile or less for their entire lives. So removal of them from that area to what you would consider a better place could actually be life-threatening for these animals. So if you find a turtle, a snake, something in your backyard or an area that you think is a poor place 
for these animals to be before you move them, please call and talk to a rehabilitator and we'll be able to let you know uh, if that animal is in any danger, the best way to help it would be maybe move on by itself uh, and what you can do to kind of promote that area to maybe make it better uh, for these animals to stay in. As always, uh, uh, make sure that you call a rehabber uh, before you, you try to do any rescues on your own to make sure that you are doing the best thing possible and the safest thing for you and that animal. Turtles are, uh, they're, they're known for crossing streets that are dangerous. Uh, again, um, turtles that are smaller, um, that uh, may look like babies, may actually be fairly old uh, and have, can have lived in an area for a very long time. Uh, our guest today to talk about this is Sheldon. So Sheldon is one of our Eastern box turtles, now called uh, woodland turtles or woodland box turtles. Uh, he's a little bit more shy than the girls. We'll give him a minute. So Sheldon here is an adult uh, box turtle. They don't really get much bigger than this. You can, uh, again, count how old they are by the rings on the shell. Uh, on one of these scoops, you can kind of get an idea of how old they are when they uh, are done growing. Uh, and he can be, he's probably about uh, 30, maybe a little bit older than that. Uh, so once they kind of reach their adult age, they don't grow anymore. Uh, but again, they can stay in that same area for uh, their entire lives, which for a turtle like this can be anywhere between 60 and 80 years. Uh, and in captivity, they can actually live to be over 100. So they're staying in a very small area for a very long time. And unfortunately for these guys, that area can change pretty drastically in 60 years. So it can go from a forest to a more developed area, but they're still going to try to get from point A to point B, regardless of what changes in between. They know the shortest route uh, from where they are to where they want to be, to uh, where they think food is, their best water sources, maybe their, uh, their hibernating spot uh, or the best basking spot. They know where, they th where these things are, uh, and they're going to try to get uh, from one place to the other regardless if there's now a highway going in between of that. So we do see a lot of turtles uh, in more developed areas and people say this is a terrible place for a turtle, we'll just take him home. Uh, unfortunately, that's what somebody tried to do for Sheldon. They said he lived uh, in a terrible spot. Uh, they didn't think it could support a turtle and they decided to take him home to their backyard. Uh, and after three years, Sheldon stopped trying to escape, but he also stopped eating. So this is very important. He was not happy in their backyard. Um, he didn't get enough sunlight. You can see he's a very pale uh, turtle. They're usually a more vibrant uh, yellow to orange to red. Um, so he's a very pale turtle. So they did try to do the best thing for him, but unfortunately that was not the, the right call to make. So we want to make sure that you know exactly where turtles come from, because once they're done with their rehab, we're going to try to get them exactly back there um, or as, uh, as close as we safely can. So we always try to, to find a, a nice wooded area or another appropriate space uh, as close to where we found as possible so that when we release them, we're not putting them back in the middle of that highway. Uh, we're putting them somewhere close by so they can get where they were going, uh, but stay safe doing so. The shell is made of bone, it's living bone, so fractures we can fix. The same as we can fix a broken arm or a broken leg, we can repair fractures to the shell, let it heal, uh, and then release it. Uh, the only problem is the shell is the spine. The spine runs right along here. Uh, so damage to the spine, the same as the damage to the spine for uh, birds or mammals, uh, could mean that we're not able uh, to properly fix and release that animal. Uh, the other thing to remember, because it is living bone, so this bone has a blood supply, um, if it is chewed, by a dog or hit by a, a lawnmower or anything like that, it is painful. Um, turtles, unfortunately, are notorious for not showing this pain, so people think that maybe they don't need anything, it's just a minor fracture, the dog only chewed part of it, um, but it is painful and they are going to need uh, not only antibiotics but a, a pain medication. So we do recommend uh, if you find a turtle in need, give a rehab or a call, make sure they can get to that spot where they can uh, get those medications that they need. Here's Sheldon. Uh, again, for, uh, for snakes, uh, we do get a lot of calls uh, for each year about snakes caught on blue tracks. 
and they also see those the same as birds they see those blue traps that maybe have uh, insects or rodents on them as free food and they will go and get themselves caught can't get themselves undone uh, again bring the whole thing to a snake trap and all and we will uh, get get them off uh, using the proper tools and uh, the proper safety uh, procedures uh, for their safety and for ours uh, and the last thing there are only uh, there are only three venomous snakes in Virginia we have the the copperhead the timber rattlesnake uh, and the cottonmouth or the water moccasin which is down in south uh, Southwest Virginia uh, and the, the other two usually like higher elevations uh, but we do want to say it, it's a lot of times we get phone calls about uh, what people think are baby copperheads in their house um, please visit the Virginia Herpetological Society's page or the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries uh, they do have a lovely book on snake identification and they show you the difference between uh, copperhead patterning and juvenile black rat snake or eastern rat snake patterning. Um, so those juvenile uh, rat snakes, which are a non-venomous species, they uh, their juveniles are patterned very similar to the cotton uh, to the um, sorry to the uh, copperheads in an attempt to protect themselves uh, when they are small. So they want. They want animals to think that they're a venomous snake uh, so that they're left alone, um, but they do have a very distinctive eye stripe that goes from the corner of the mouth, across the eye, across the bridge of their nose, and down the other side. Uh, and this is a very good indication to pay attention to, uh, to make sure that the, uh, the animal that you see is not a venomous snake, or, or may or may not be. And if you're not sure, you can always take some pictures give us a call and we would be happy to help you with that identification to make sure you're safe and to make sure those animals are taken care of. So we want to thank you very much for joining us for this series and we hope that we have been helpful. Um, please come back uh, and join us again for other discussions about wildlife and always remember if you find something that you think is in need help, a wild animal that needs us, please give us a call. We are more than happy to